Oh, you who believe, give charity for the pleasure of Allah. The pleasure of Allah. Oh, you who believe, read the Quran every night of Ramadan. Night of Ramadan. Welcome, oh Ramadan. Dear brothers and sisters in Islam and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Welcome to the show. Ramadan, a date with Dr. Zakia. I'm your host, Yusuf Chambers, and today we will be discussing the topic Suhoor and Iftar. Dr. Zakia, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And how are you today? Fine, thank you, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. I'd like to start the topic with an essential one. Even myself, I'm not 100% sure of the implications of the terms suhoor and iftar. Could you shed some light on these uh, terms for us? Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Ala rasulillah wa ala ali wa sahibi ajmain. Amma baad. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. Bismillahi rahman rahim Rabbi shuhali sadri. Wa yassalli amri. Wa halul ugdat min lisani yafqaf gawli. The word suhoor, it is derived from the Arabic word Sahar, which means the later part of the night. And its plural is called as Ashar. And Arabic word Sahur means a meal which is taken just before the break of dawn. And the Arabic word Suhur is the act of taking the meal Sahur. So Suhur is the act and Sahur is the pre-dawn meal. As far as the Arabic word Iftar is concerned, the word iftar is derived from the Arabic word fatr, which means to tear or which means to break. And the word fatur means the meal taken to break the fast. And the Arabic word iftar means the act of taking the meal to break the fast. I see. So Dr. Zakia, what is the significance of taking the sahur, the pre-dawn meal? According to the saying of a beloved Prophet Muhammad it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1923, where a beloved Prophet said that sahur, the pre-dawn meal, in it is blessing. It's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number two, in the book of fasting, hadith number 2413, that it's mentioned that the difference between the fasting of the Muslims and the people of the book, the Ahli Kitab, the Jews and Christian, is the taking of the sahur, the pre-dawn meal. So that is the act which differentiates between the fasting of the Muslims and the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians. It's mentioned in the Silsila Asayya, volume number three, hadith number 1045, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that blessings are found in three things. One is the jama'ah, that is a congregation. The true is a tarid, that's a sort of a food. And the third is the sahur, the pre-dawn meal. A similar message is repeated in Silsila as sayya volume number three, hadith number 1291, where our beloved prophet said, blessings are in two things. One is sahur and one is a just measurement, that is while weighing. And there are several hadith in which our beloved prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he has talking about sahur that in it is blessing and it's better for the Muslim Ummah. It's also mentioned in Say al Jame, volume number one, hadith number 3683. One of the Sahabas enters the house of the Prophet when he's having his suhoor. And the Prophet says that in the suhoor is a blessing, so do not leave it. And a similar message is given in Musnad Ahmad, where the Prophet said that suhoor is blessed. So do not leave it, even if you have a gulp of water. Because Allah and His angels, 
they send blessings on the person who has sahur. And similar messages given to several Sahih Hadith, including Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number 2, Hadith number 2337, where a person enters when the Prophet is having his suhoor, and the Prophet says that, have suhoor, it is a blessing for you. And in the suhoor is a blessing. So there are various hadith talking about the blessings of suhoor. So it is a niyama. And the reason the Prophet always said they have suhoor, so that the people don't overburden themselves. Because when we fast, they should have the suhoor. So that, you know, they don't overburden themselves and they have the proper fast. Okay, thank you very much for that answer, Dr. Zakir. Just some, a little question, or it could be just a clarification. Regarding the historical significance from the Qur'an regarding suhoor, the pre-dawn meal, before the Qur'an stipulated exactly how it should be taken, how did the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, start and begin the fast? Before the Qur'an gave the exact details of the timings of suhoor, etc., the Sahaba, the Dharam of the Prophet, before the Quranic verse of Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 87, was revealed, they used to follow what was practiced earlier by the Ahl-e-Kitab, by the people of the book. And that you get from various records, even from the Hadith, etc. And at that time, they were supposed to have the iftar immediately after sunset. And once they went to sleep, they could not have any meal. Then they had to fast the complete next day, and they could only have the meal next day after sunset. So this was the practice that was followed earlier. And there's a hadith which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, Book of Fasting, hadith number 1915, where it mentions about a sahaba by the name of Qais ibn Sirmar al-Ansari. And he comes one day to the house at the time of iftar, after doing a lot of hard work, and he tells his wife that I'm hungry, please can I have some food for iftar. So the wife says, there's no food in the house, I will go and get from outside. So when she goes out to get food, because this Sahaba, Qais, may Allah be pleased with him, he was very tired. So before the wife comes back, he goes to sleep. Sleep overtakes him. So by the time the wife comes back and she sees the husband sleeping, she says, oh, what a disappointment. Now we can't have the meal. So when he gets up, next day he could not have the food, and he had to fast the whole next day. And by the time evening comes, he faints. So they took the matter to the Prophet and told him what had happened. And after that, the verse of the Quran, Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 187 was revealed that you can approach your wife and eat and drink until the white thread of dawn is differentiated from the black thread. So then were the rules laid down. That means you could eat the full night and then the verse continues again fast till the night falls, mostly sunset. So before this verse was revealed, the action of the fast was different. They could have only one meal immediately after sunset. And once they sleep, they could not have again until this verse of Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 97 was revealed. And that's what we follow today. Well, that's very comforting to know that we, we can have the, the dawn meal because I think a lot of people will be suffering otherwise at the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed. Dr. Zakir, you mentioned a verse just now. Can we just ask you the significance of that verse? Eat and drink until the white thread of dawn appears distinct from the black thread. When this verse was revealed for the first time, Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 187, it said that eat and drink till the white thread you can differentiate from the black thread. The moment this verse was revealed, the Sahabas understood the meaning as the verse was revealed. And it's mentioned in Sayy al-Bukhari, volume number six, hadith number 4509, that one Saba, the moment he heard this verse, he took two hair strings, one black and one white, and he kept it beneath his pillow. And when he got up for Sahur, he tried to differentiate between the white string from the black string, and he could not really understand, so he went to the Prophet and asked him, what does it mean? And another hadith that's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number six, hadith number 4510, where it says that one Sahaba, he took two threads, one black thread and one white thread. And he tied it in his toes, in the legs. And he kept on eating until he can differentiate between these two threads. 
But when they went to the prophet and asked, what does it mean that until you can differentiate the white thread from the black thread, then the prophet made them understand. That what it actually means is until you can differentiate the white thread of dawn, that means the light of dawn, from the black thread of night. And then the verse was revealed incomplete. And the word of dawn was revealed later on. First the verse was, until you can differentiate the white thread from the black thread. Then Allah reveals in between white thread of dawn. So the complete verse then is revealed. So then it was made clear. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad he explained the meaning of two fajr. And he said that the first fajr is known as the false fajr, where you see a vertical white streak of light, which is somewhat similar to the tail of a fox. But that is known as the false fajr. And the second fajr, which is the true fajr, is when the redness of light, it spreads horizontally in the sky, which you can see it in the mountains and which reaches the houses and the streets. So that is the true fajr. That is the break of dawn when a person should stop eating at that time. And this is clarified further in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad It's mentioned in a Sahih hadith of Al-Bayaki, hadith number 8003, where the Prophet said, the first fajr does not prohibit you from eating the food and it does not make the fajr prayer lawful. And the second fajr, that is the true fajr, it makes the eating of food prohibited and it makes the fajr salah lawful. So he made the differentiation between the two types of fajr. And further it's mentioned in the hadith of Sunan Abu Daud, volume number two, in the book of fasting, hadith number 2348, where the Prophet said, let the people continue eating and drinking and should not stop when they see the white vertical light. And they should keep on eating until they see the horizontal redness of Fajr. That is the true Fajr. And it's further mentioned in Sai Muslim, volume number two, in the book of fasting, hadith number 2407 and 2408. Hadith Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. She said that let not the call of Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, and the whiteness of the first Fajr deceive the people and let them not stop eating. That means they can continue eating. And there's another hadith which says that let not the call of Hazrat Bilal deceive you. Continue eating until you hear the call of Ummi Maktoum. So this actually is the complete meaning of the Quranic verse that you can eat until the white thread of dawn becomes distinct from the black thread of night. Thank you very much for the answer. Dr. Zakir, is there any specific time for taking the sahur mentioned in the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam? As far as the sahur is concerned, sahur is the pre-dawn meal. It can be taken any time from midnight up to just before the break of dawn. And as the Quran says, which I mentioned earlier, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 187, eat and drink until the white thread of dawn appears to you distinct from the black thread. So you can have the sahur anytime from midnight up to the break of dawn. But according to the sunnah of the Prophet, it is preferable to delay the sahur as late as possible and just before the break of dawn. That is preferable. And there are various hadith mentioning about that. The hadith which is mentioned in Musannaf, Ibn Shaiba, hadith number 9057, where a man tells Ibn Abbas, may Allah please with him, that he had the suhoor till he doubted it was the break of dawn. The moment he had a doubt it was the break of dawn, he stopped. So Ibn Abbas, may Allah please with him, he said that keep on having the meal until your doubt is clarified that the dawn has broken. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1921, Zaid bin Thabit, May Allah be pleased with him. He said that after he had sued with the Prophet, he went for Salah. And then he asked the Prophet, what is the time difference between the suhur and the Adhan? So the Prophet replied, it is equal to the time required to recite 50 verses of the Quran. Further, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1918 and hadith number 1919, where Hadith Aisha, 
May Allah be pleased with her. She said that the Prophet said that when you hear the Adhan, when you hear Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, pronounce the call for prayer, pronounce the Adhan, please don't get deceived by it and continue eating and drinking until you hear the Adhan of Ibn Ummi Maktoum. For he does not pronounce the Adhan until it is dawn. That means you can eat till dawn. That is the time for suhoor. But there are various hadith talking about the sunnah of delaying the suhoor. It's mentioned in Sahih Jame, volume number one, hadith number 2835, where a beloved Prophet said that you should hasten in breaking the fast and delay in having the suhoor. It's further mentioned in a Sahih hadith of uh, Al Bahaki, hadith number 8127, that the Sahabas, they were the first to break their fast and they were the last to do their suhoor. Further it's mentioned in a Sahih hadith of uh, Al Bahaki, hadith number 8125, in which Prophet said that we prophets have been commanded that we should be the first to break the fast and the last to take the sword and place our right hand over the left when we offer salah. So based on these ahadith, it shows that sword can be had from any time between midnight to the break of dawn, but it is preferable delaying your sahur. Dr. Zakia, is it allowed for one to eat and drink even when the Mu'adhin announces the uh, call to prayer for Fajr? Is it allowed to eat and drink? Some people, I'm not sure whether it's correct or not, but some people believe that you can eat and drink all the way up to the Fajr Adhan and beyond. I'm aware that there are some Muslims who believe that you can eat and drink until the Fajr Adhan ends. And there are some people who, when they can hear various Adhan of different mosques from their house, they wait till they hear the end of the last Adhan. So if they can hear five, six Adhan, they wait till the last Adhan ends, till that time they eat and drink. In fact, this is not proved from any of the Hadith of the Prophet. And anyone who innovates a new thing in the Deen, it has to be rejected. It's mentioned in the Hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, Hadith number 2697, that anyone who innovates a new thing in the Deen, it has to be rejected. In fact, it's clearly mentioned in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 187, that eat and drink until the white thread of dawn becomes distinct to you from the black thread. That means the moment dawn breaks, moment you hear the adhan, you have to stop eating. And as I quoted earlier, the hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, volume number 3, book of fasting, hadith number 1918 and hadith number 1919, where Hazrat Aisha Mellah be pleased with her, she said, when you hear the Adhan of Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, continue eating and drinking until you hear the Adhan of Ibn Ummi Maktoum. For when he gives the Adhan, it is the time for Fajr, that dawn breaks up. That means the moment you hear the Adhan, you stop eating. The moment you hear the Adhan, you stop eating. But there is a concession given by a beloved Prophet Sallallahu It's mentioned in a Sahih Hadith of Sunan Abu Daud, volume number two, in the Book of Fasting, Hadith number 2343, where the beloved Prophet said, and when you hear the Adhan, and if you have a drinking vessel in your hand, you are allowed to satisfy yourself from that vessel. That means a beloved Prophet has given a concession that while you're eating or drinking, something is in your hand, you can complete it. But that doesn't mean that if you have a big sandwich in your hand, that you complete it. If you have a bite left, of that sandwich in your hand, and then you've had it, it's fine. Or when you drink a glass of water, and there is something left in it, you can have it. That doesn't mean you can go out of your way and touch your hand and pick up another glass of water and keep on having, have a big burger or a sandwich and keep on eating for a few minutes after the adhan started. And it's a misconception that you can eat till the end of the adhan. There's no hadith saying that. Because you start the adhan the moment the fajr prayer's time starts. A moment, it's the break of dawn, the adhan has to be given. The moment you hear the Adhan, you have to stop eating. Dr. Zakia, when is the correct and the best time to break the fast? The best time to break the fast is as soon as night falls. 
as the Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 187, eat and drink until the white thread of dawn becomes distinct to you from the black thread and keep the fast until night falls. The moment you see the sunset, that is the best time that you should break the fast. And there is a hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1954, where the beloved Prophet said, when you see the night falls from this side and the day vanishes from this side and the disk of the sun sets, you have to break your fast. Another hadith mentioned by Abu Sayyid, may Allah be with him, of Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, book of fasting, chapter number 45. He said, we broke the fast moment we saw that the sun had set. And our beloved Prophet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as I mentioned earlier, it's mentioned in Sahih Jami, volume number one, hadith number 2835, that our beloved Prophet said that you should hasten in breaking your fast and you should delay your suhoor. It's mentioned in Sahih Hadith of Al-Bahaqi, Hadith number 8127, that the Sahabas, the companions of the Prophet, they were the first to break the fast and they were the last to have the suhoor. It's also mentioned in Al-Bahaqi, Hadith number 8125, that Prophet Muhammad said that we Prophets have been commanded that we have to hasten in breaking our fast and delay our suhoor and keep the right hand over the left while offering salah. There are various other hadith which specifically mention that we have to hasten the breaking of the fast. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1957, that our beloved prophet said that my people will be on the right path till the time they hasten in breaking their fast. It's further mentioned in Sayyid Ibn Ibn, volume number 8, hadith number 3510, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad said that my people will be on the sunnah till the time they do not wait for the stars to break the fast. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad also said, it's mentioned in Sayyid Ibn Ibn, hadith number 3509, that the beloved Prophet said that my religion will be seen till the time my people, they hasten in breaking the fast and not do like the Jews and Christians to delay the fast. So based on all this say Ahadith, we have to realize that we have to break the fast as early as possible. It is the best. Immediately after the sun sets. Dr. Zakir, in difference to what you've said, there are some people who delay the breaking of the fast and the Maghrib prayer on the premise that they don't believe the sun has completely set and on the basis that they believe it's always better to be on the safe side. Is this a correct logic? There are a large number of Muslims who they want to be safe and they delay the breaking of the fast. Even though the sun has said, they said, let's wait for about three or four minutes, you know, then we'll break. Because they want to be careful, because there's a hadith of a beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's mentioned in Sayyid al-Targib, hadith number 991, where the Prophet, he speaks about his dream, that he has a dream, and he's taken up, and there he hears the sound of people howling, and he asks that, who are these people? These are the people in hellfire. Then he's taken to another corner, and he sees that people are hung from the hamstring, and the corner of the mouths are torn, and there is blood dripping. So he asks, that who are these people? So the reply is, these are the people who broke their fast early. So based on this hadith that if a person breaks the fast early, he'll be hung from the hamstring and his mouth will be torn and there'll be dripping of blood. People go out of their way to take a precaution and they delay by four or five minutes. Now this is again the sunnah. Breaking early is wrong, but delaying it is also wrong. Because as I mentioned earlier, it's clearly mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 187, that keep the fast until night falls. And as I mentioned earlier in the earlier answer, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 3, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1954, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that when night 
falls from this side and the day vanishes from this side and when the sun sets you break your fast and there are various other hadith which I quoted earlier including Sahih Bukhari volume number 3 in the book of fasting hadith number 1957 our beloved prophet said that my people will be on the straight path till the time they hasten to break the fast it's mentioned in Sahih Ibn Ibn volume number 8 hadith number 3510 that the beloved prophet Muhammad said that my people will be on the sunnah till the time they don't wait to see the stars to break the fast. And it's also mentioned in Sayyid Ibn Ibn, volume number 8, hadith number 3509, that the beloved Prophet Muhammad said, that my religion will be seen till the time my people hasten in breaking the fast and do not delay like the Hale Kitab, the Jews and the Christians. So here there are various hadith talking about you should hasten breaking the fast. But natural, it should be after the sun has set. We cannot break the fast before the sun sets. But the moment it's confirmed that the sun has set with your own eyes, or nowadays there are clocks, there are watches, you can easily time yourself. So there's no need of waiting for a five minutes and taking a precaution. If you do that, that's what the Prophet said, that my ummah will not be on the sunnah. So to be on the sunnah, on the right track, the moment the sun sets, you should break the fast immediately. I think it's very clear, isn't it? The answer is very clear. Alhamdulillah. Like so many things in the deen, very clear. What did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam refer to eat in breaking his fast? It's mentioned in the hadith of Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number two in the book of fasting, hadith number 2349. It's mentioned that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he used to break his fast, he used to have fresh dates, not rutub, fresh dates. And if he did not find fresh dates, he used to have dried dates. And if that wasn't available, he used to have water. So the best is to have fresh date, that is the sunnah of the Prophet. If you can't find fresh date, then you can have dried dates. If you can't find dried date, then have water. If you can't find water, then any food that's available, you can break your fast. And if you can't find any food, or if you're midway traveling, then at least you break the fast with the intention. You intend in your heart that you've broken the fast, and as soon as you find food, you can have it. SubhanAllah, hopefully we won't be in that situation these days. One never knows. Doctor, is, what's the best thing to announce whilst you're breaking the fast? The dua or the prayer or any announcement which is uh, specific for breaking the fast? Many Muslims, they say many duas before they put the food in their mouth. And all these dua that is there of breaking the fast, most of them, they are zaif or they are unauthentic, they are maudu. The authentic dua while breaking the fast is of Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number two, book of fasting, hadith number 2350, in which the Prophet recited, it's mentioned, Zahab Zama, Wapta Lati Uruku, Wapta Al Ajr, inshallah, which means that the thirst has been quenched, the veins have been moistened, and the reward is certain if Allah wills. Now, though this dua is authentic, some of them say this dua before they put their food in their mouth, before they break the fast, which by meaning itself, it doesn't make sense. This dua is supposed to be said after you put the food in the mouth. The right thing is, before you put the food in the mouth, you have to say Bismillah. That was the practice of our beloved Prophet Wasallam. And after he ate the dates and water, or he ate food, and he had water, then this dua makes sense. Zahab al-Zama, wabtalati uruku. Inshallah, which means my thirst has been quenched. Only when you have water can your thirst be quenched. So how can you say this dua before you break the fast? Only after you break the fast and you had dates and you had the fruits or you had the food and then you had water can you say that my thirst has been quenched and my veins have moistened and the reward is certain. Inshallah. And there are various other ahadith of Abu Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So as far as the dua, immediately before breaking the fast, say Bismillah. And after breaking, when your thirst is quenched, you have to read this dua. But there are other hadith. It's mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number three, hadith number 1752, that the beloved prophet said that the dua of three people are never unanswered, means they're always answered. That is the dua, the supplication of a just ruler and imam, the dua of a person who fast until he breaks his fast. And 
the dua of an oppressed. The same myth is repeated in Ibn Majah, volume number three, hadith number 1753, that a person who fasts, his dua is accepted when he breaks his fast. So before breaking the fast, you can do any dua, you can pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in your own language, in the Arabic, Rabbana atina fid dunya hasnatu fil akhirat hasnatu fil kinaza bin nar. Any dua you can ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ask for forgiveness, ask for supplication, whatever you feel, you can ask, this is the best time before breaking the fast. Thank you very much, Dr. Zakia. Now we are furnished with the information. We can go out there and break our fast more appropriately, inshallah. Dr. Zakia, now we've uh, completed the interview stage on suhoor and uh, iftar. Once again, we have many questions from the audience, and I think it's time that we answered some of them, don't you? Inshallah. The first question, member of the audience, he asks, or he or she could be, different du'as are recited at the beginning of the fast, during the sahur, which is the most authentic? As far as reciting any dua, I do not know of any say hadith in which the Prophet has recited any dua at the suhur time, or any of the sahaba has mentioned any dua. I don't know of any. In fact, what a Prophet said, it's mentioned in the hadith of Tirmidhi, in the book of fasting, hadith number 730, a beloved Prophet said that anyone who has not intended to fast before dawn, there's no fast for him. The Prophet so said, Hadith of Rasulullah Nisai, in the book of fasting, Hadith number 2331, a beloved Prophet Wasallam said, there is no fast for a person who has not intended to fast the night before. That means intention is compulsory for fasting. It should be done before the break of dawn, or, as the hadith says, that the night before, means any time before the break of dawn, you can intend. But when you intend, you need not say it loudly. It's not required. Because you intend in the heart. So the main thing is you intend in your heart that you're going to fast, and that's sufficient. When you want to pray, you intend. You do niya for praying, and you pray. You don't have to say it loudly. The same way, you don't have to say that, I intend to fast. But many people, many of the Muslims have invented words in Arabic or in different languages that I intend to fast tomorrow, etc., etc., which we don't find in any of the Sahih Hadith, and neither do we find in the sayings of the Prophet or of the Sahabas. So the best is to intend in your heart, that's it, and there's no particular dua for suhoor. Okay, that's uh, very enlightening, that answer. Hope that answers the question of the participant, the audience. Next question from our audience. If a person has the intention of waking for the suhoor, but unfortunately he or she doesn't manage to wake up, is his or her fast still accepted? If a person before sleeping has the intention of fasting tomorrow, and he had the intention of getting up for suhoor, but could not get up for suhoor because he overslept, etc., having suhoor is not fard al sunnah. Our beloved Prophet said in Sahih Bukhari, verse number three in the book of fasting, hadith number 1923, he said that in the suhoor is a blessing. It's a sunnah, recommended sunnah, but if a person oversleeps, it's not a fard to have suhoor. Because he had the intention of getting up, he had the intention to fast, his fast will be accepted. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir. Next question. Somebody wants to know, did the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam recommend any particular food for the dawn meal? It's mentioned in a say hadith of Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number two, in the book of fasting. Hadith number 2338, the beloved Prophet said, the believer's meal, the best, is dates for suhoor. For the pre-dawn meal, for suhoor, the best meal is the date. The Prophet also said, it's mentioned in Musnad Ahmad, Hadith number 11086, the Prophet said that have suhoor even if it's a gulp of water. So the best is dates and he had other things and you should also have water. So these are the things that the Prophet recommended for Suhoor. Dates must have some amazing scientific qualities. We need a program in itself just to discuss that. Dr. Zakia, next question, question four. There's a hadith which mentions that if a person eats or drinks forgetfully, then Allah has provided him with food and drink. Last Ramadan, whilst fasting, my husband requested me a glass of water, not realizing that he was fasting, I served him with a glass of water and he drank. 
Should I have reminded him that he was fasting or consider it a provision from Allah? The question is rightly mentioned that the beloved partner وسلم, he has mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, worm number three, in the book of fasting, hadith number 1933, the beloved prophet said that if a person unintentionally, out of forgetfulness, while fasting, has something to eat or drink, he should complete his fast. And what he has eaten and what he drank, he should think it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, but a person who has unintentionally out of forgetfulness, it is totally valid, he could complete the fast. But here, the husband has forgotten. The wife knew it very well. What the wife should have done was, she should have reminded the husband. Because the Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 110, Enjoin what is good and forbid what is wrong and believe in Allah. So here, it was the duty of the wife to remind the husband that he was fasting. And Quran says that Ta'un al biri al taqwa that it will help each other in good deeds, goodness and righteousness. So here it was the duty of the wife because she knew that the husband was fasting. If she did not know and she gave it, it would have been forgiven. But because knowing very well that the husband was fasting, she purposefully gave it to him. I feel what she had done is wrong. It's a sin. But as far as the husband is concerned, he asked for water not knowing that he was fasting. His fast would be accepted. It would be completed. And that's the provision of Allah. But she should have reminded him. So she that fault, the husband is not at fault. Zakhala here for the answer. Dr. Zakir. Another question. We're racing through them now. We've got so many questions, subhanAllah. How do we calculate a time of suhoor and iftar in countries which have no distinction between night and day. As far as those countries or those cities which have very long days or short days or very long nights or short nights, as long as there is clear distinction between day and night, where you can come to know the sunset and sunrise, in these countries they have to observe the same rules of fasting, right from dawn up to sunset. And after sunset, up to the time of dawn, they can eat and drink and approach their wife. But in those countries and those places where there's no distinction between the day and night, where you can't come to know when does the sun rise, when does the sun set, or you have day for days together for more than 24 hours, or you have night for night together, you know, for more than 24 hours. In these places, they should follow the timing of the city or the country which is closest to them which has a clear distinction between day and night. Okay, that's very, very clear, isn't it? If a person is fasting and traveling long distance in a plane and is midway to his destination, should he break his fast according to the time of origin or the time at destination as there is a difference between the two of, of several hours? This normally happens and I do keep on traveling during Ramadan quite often in planes and this is a common problem and people not aware of the Sharia, of the ruling. Many of them say, oh, I will break the fast according to the time of origin, some say time of destination and there's a big confusion between most of the travelers. But the right ruling is that as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 187, that fast until night appears. Another beloved Prophet said in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, book of fasting, hadith number 1954, that until the sun sets. So when a person is traveling in a plane, it is very easy. He should just slide the window up and see the sun. The moment the sun sets, he can break it fast. He should not bother what is the time of the origin, what is the time at the destination. He should see that where he is, from the position where he is, the moment if he sees the sun set, complete disk has vanished, you should break the fast. Similarly for suhoor, the moment he sees the vertical white streak of dawn, it is the false dawn. The true dawn is when he sees a reddish horizontal. When he sees that, it's the time for suhoor, you should stop eating. So while a person is in a plane, it's very easy to disappear. You don't have to ask anyone, just slide the window up. If it's not from his side, he can go to the other side and see the sun and decide whether the time is there for suhoor or for iftar. No, oh, you've made a very, what sounds very, a very complicated very <laughs> situation to be very simple, in fact. Alhamdulillah. That's the purpose of these programs, isn't it? Alhamdulillah. Another question. Question seven. If a person breaks his fast 
after sunset on the ground and immediately takes off in a plane and then sees the sun, does he have to stop eating? Um, is his fast valid or should he repeat it? And this situation can happen to a traveller that he's in a place and the time for iftar, if the sun is set and he has iftar and immediately the plane takes off, maybe two minutes after iftar. The sun sets at six o'clock and 6.02, two minutes after six o'clock the plane takes off and the moment the plane takes off it goes at a high altitude and at that time you can see the sun. So what happened? Does he have to stop eating? The person who has completed his fast where he was staying, the fast is valid. He doesn't have to stop eating. The fast of that day is finished. He has completed the fast. He can have the star. Even when he goes to a high altitude and he sees the sun, he need not stop eating. His fast is completed. But on the other hand, if a person takes off two minutes before at 5.58 or two minutes to six, two minutes is balanced to break his fast. And if he takes off and then sees the sun, and he sees the sun for another 5-10 minutes, he should not break his fast. He can't say, okay, while at the ground 2 minutes for left, so now at the 6 o'clock, the time is up, I will break my fast, because there he can see the sun. So at that time, he should continue fasting only after the sun sets, maybe after 5 minutes or 10 minutes or 15 minutes, that is the time that he should break his fast. And similarly, while traveling in a plane, if suppose the pilot is there and the sun can be seen, the pilot should not take the plane down so that you can break the fast early. But if there's a technical problem and you have to change the altitude and come down, and if the sun sets for the person in the plane, then they can break the fast. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir. Next question. I can hear two adhans from different mosques, and the timing of both the adhans differ by a few minutes. When should I break fast? At the first or second adhan? As far as breaking of the fast is concerned, the two adhans, and both the time differ, you have to find out that which of the two muaddin mentions the adhan, pronounces the adhan at the right time. The right time is when the sun sets. As the beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, volume number three in the book of fasting, hadith number 1954, that when the night comes from this side and the day vanishes from this side and the sun sets, that is the time if you break the fast. So best is you have to first find out which of the two muaddin is pronouncing the adhan at the right time. Or if there's a doubt, best is, today is the age of science and technology, we have a chart which exactly tells the time when the sun sets, and you can match it with your own watch, the time, or you can match the adhan, which of the two muaddin gives the right adhan, and that's the right time we should break the fast. You should not say that whichever muaddin gives first you have to break. If there's a difference, try and find out which of the two muaddin pronounces the adhan at the right time. Or best is, you do it yourself, you verify your watch at the right time, see the timetable and break the fast at the right time. Couldn't happen in the UK because we can't hear people reciting the uh, adhan, unfortunately. I wish we could. Question nine. Once we invited a guest for iftar, he said it is discouraged to talk whilst eating in the religion of Islam. Is he correct? I don't know of any hadith of the Prophet Muhammad where he said that you should not speak while eating, etc. In fact, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 59, that if there's a difference, go back to Allah and Rasul. There's no text in the Quran which says you should not speak while eating. There's no text in the hadith in which the Prophet commanded you should not speak while eating. In fact, there are hadith exactly the opposite. The Prophet spoke while eating. For example, if you read the hadith of Sai Muslim, volume number 3, hadith number 5093, where the Prophet was served vinegar and he said that vinegar is a good food while eating. There are other hadith in which the Prophet said that do not eat with your left hand, for the Satan eats with the left hand. Again, this is while eating. Other hadith of Sai Bukhari, volume number 7, hadith number 5376, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad said there was a boy who was eating with the Prophet and he was moving his hand around. So the Prophet said, eat with the right hand and eat from what is close to you. So this he said while eating. So all these hadith prove that there is no restriction for speaking while eating. But whenever there's a difference, go back to Allah and the Rasul and we'll get the answer. That's very clear, thank you. Last question. If a person's earnings are known to be haram, can we accept his iftar invitation? There's no hadith saying that you cannot accept the invitation of iftar of a person who has unlawful earning. In fact, there are hadith showing that Prophet Muhammad he went 
to the meal when invited by the Jews. And the Quran said the Jews used to involve themselves in usury. And usury is a bit haram. So based on the fatwas of various scholars, they say that if such person calls you for iftar, it is a blessing for you and a sin for him. If he has earned something from wrong means, he'll be held responsible. You won't be responsible for that. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Zakir, for that final answer. That is, we've reached the end of today's show. We've been talking, of course, about Suhoor and Iftar. And, brothers and sisters, now you've got plenty of ammunition to go forth in this Ramadan. Make sure you start your fast and end your fast in the correct way. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow peace and blessings upon all of us during this holy month of Ramadan. And I would ask you to join us tomorrow, same time, when we will be discussing the objectives of fasting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> يومنا صبر ورق بدموع البائسين رمضان قد أهل بالصيام وأطل مسعدا أهلا وخلا لتهو في كل